Hello my soccer universe. Well, today I'm wearing my Centenary USA jersey because uh, the day I'm recording this was the last day seven years ago that I actually spent in the States. Um, when this is posting, I'm celebrating seven years back in Europe. So yeah, this were... Uh, a, it was a bold move to do that without much... Uh, you know, too much thought just doing it, uh, not knowing much without having just a little safety net, but yeah, I think in the end it paid off. Enough of me, I was thinking, shall I, sh shall I do another video on which leagues are gonna start and what things are, but to be honest, uh, <laughs> I, th I thought I'm gonna do my uh, what to watch video where I can probably put this information in there and let's do another book video. And I'm gonna talk about my favorite soccer book. Uh, the reason I have been waiting for this for a while is because um, I read the first edition of this book and I recently acquired the fourth edition, but I still have not gotten around to actually reading it all. Uh, and the book is worth tracking down the different editions because they are adding uh, content continuously. I'm talking, of course, about soccer nomics. I've already written about this on my blog. This book is awesome. This book will change the way you think about soccer. Simply put. Um, it is soccer's version of Moneyball, in a way. If you know Mal Mal Moneyball is kind of how um, data science uh, made baseball a different game and this is the version of that and it's actually heavily influenced by Moneyball as well. Uh, I see already slight changes taking place um, and we'll look in the few chapters. I have three reading samples that I want to give to you from that one. Um, that actually I see already uh, big clubs adopting some tenets that when this came out, I think the first one came out in 2009 and then I got this kind of with a afterward for the 2010 World Cup um, where yeah uh, you could kind of uh, see this was a different time now uh, then than it is now. There have already been some uh, things implemented there. Uh, it's basically uh, Split in three chapters, but before that, of course, who has written it? Simon Cooper and Stefan Szymanski. Simon Cooper, we already saw with Soccer Against the Enemy, another book that I highly recommend. Um, and Stefan Szymanski is a uh, economist who deals on data a lot. And they have other people that they frequently um, mention in this book, you know, science people, data people, like me, I'm a statistician by trade, so uh, it's really, really, really interesting to see how uh, the nerds are kind of looking at soccer in a slightly different way, and you see quite some interesting things. Now, when I say uh, data nerds and so on, I definitely have to say, um, the m for me as a, you know, having a PhD in statistics, the math in this book is very minimal. It's much, it's very much readable. They even uh, show you the concepts. They assume of you have no math knowledge. I've seen other, other books where you need to be a little bit more uh, in tune with all that, but here, no, absolutely not. You, it is very re readable. And it goes, actually, it has three parts, as I said. The first one is the clubs, they tackling, um, um, topics like racism, stupidity, bad transfers, capital cities, the Leicester City fairy tale, and what actually happened in the penalty shootout in Moscow. So this is all on the club level. They also look at the fans, loyalty, suicides, and happiness. Very interesting chapter, but the one that I will not read. It's very short, um, but basically it goes uh, two Brazilians jump off the buildings when... Um, uh, Brazil loses or is eliminated from, from the World Cup as is, or um, how loyal are fans, you know, uh, do fans choose one team and stick with that team, or do they shop around? This answer might surprise you, most are shopping around, to be honest, so yeah. Um, and then about individual countries and nations, and you know, the first one is why poor countries are poor, why England loses, and uh, then what's the 
what's the key for uh, soccer nations to actually become better. And the long and short short of it is all down to networking. I want to take the synopsis of that because it's really interesting. It's basically net networking. The nucleus is kind of, in a way, the Netherlands, Germany, um, France, potentially Italy, the initial European Union countries that were already cooperating together. They also could cooperate in soccer together. And if you see, this was all transferred. Spain was, I don't want to say a backwater, but Spain was had uh, big money and had the great clubs. But once Greif came there, he adopted the um, uh, the tenet of you know this team game uh, short passing and so on. And also the one shortcut is get coaches from that. Then you get kind of the from that area. And yeah, uh, keep uh, net or keep looking, looking, but don't get stuck in your own problem. I uh, actually want to start the reading uh, first, and it, no, it's not really a reading sample. But the why England loses and other Europeans win is one of my favorite chapters in there. Uh, and I'm I'm not going to read much of it and just give you the head. head, head. They really go deep. Uh, but let, let me start. Yes. Uh, why England loses and other Europeans win. Here's what I wrote in the first edition of Soconomics, which appeared nine months before the World Cup of 2010. When the England team flies to South Africa uh, for the World Cup, an ancient ritual will start to unfold. Perfected over England's 14 previous failures to win the competition away from home, it follows this pattern. Phase 1. Pre-tournament. Certainty that England will win the World Cup. I'm not going to read. I'm going to go only through the phases because they are, they are descriptive in themselves. Phase 2. During the tournament, England meets a former wartime enemy. Maybe that's worth reading. In six of the, its last nine World Cups, and this is now ahead of 2010, so we have 2014, 18, and not in there, mind you. Uh, England was knocked out by either Germany or Argentina. The matches fit seamlessly into the Brit uh, British tabloid view of history, except for the outcome. As Alan Ball summed up the mood of England's dressing room after the defeat to West Germany in 1970, it was disbelief. Even Joe Gatchens, who scored the winning goal for the US against England in 1950, turns out to have been a German of German Haiten origin, not Belgian Haiten, as is always said. And in any case, the US is another form of wartime enemy. Well, for England, they probably fought wars anywhere, so it's kind of a. Um, they were eliminated by. Yeah, Italy was a wartime enemy, but I'm not sure about, uh, about the Uruguay and Costa Rica. That is a little bit shaky, and last time they were eliminated by Croatia. Yeah, I don't know. You let, 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 no, sure, there was a, some war. Then, phase three. The English conclude that the game turned on one freakish piece of bad luck that could happen only to them. And having written that into, uh, before the 2010 World Cup just made it even more hilarious. Because what happened? They play against Germany and then the goal uh, of Lampard did not stand. But it changed history. Uh, phase four. Moreover, everyone else cheated. Well, Maradona? And all the others. Phase 5. England is knocked out without getting anywhere near lifting the cup. Well, not exactly 2018, but you know, we know. We know that England usually, usually is rare to make it to the semifinals. Phase 6. The day after elimination, normal life resumes. Duh. Because in the end, <laughs> we all care about the clubs anyway. And then phase 7. A scapegoat is found. Uh, that, you know, Beckham. The classic example and phase eight, England enters the next World Cup thinking it will win it. And why do they want to win it? Why do they think they win it? Because they are the mother nation, which, uh, as the book clearly damned them damn, damn, it, is not really the case. It's not really a good way of doing it. So, yeah, uh, really, really interesting uh, stuff. What they come up with in, in, in the end is that uh, given the potential that England has, they're a uh, top tier soccer nation, but they're not at the top, top, top. That uh, reaching quarterfinals on a regular basis is actually a rather uh, good performance. And I think, uh, I remember that and I think until 2010, they said that England actually mostly overperformed of what the expectation is, and they give some um, numbers behind it. The first real reading sample that I want to give you is when it comes to stupidity on the transfer market. It's just um, hilarious. It's a short sample, and they say, uh, "What are the uh, 
what are the tenets that you should go uh, in the transfer market? One is that stars of recent World Cup or European champions are overvalued and source super superstars in general. So don't buy those, kind of. Um, the second, that's the one I'm gonna read you, uh, certain nationalities are overvalued. And um, let's read that. Clubs will pay more for a player from a fashionable soccer country. American goalkeeper Casey Keller says that in the transfer market it's good to be Dutch. Giovanni van Broncos is the best example, Keller told Christoph Biermann. He, uh, he, who wrote another data-centric book uh, in German, The Football Matrix. Highly recommend if you can find a translation for that. That's also a great, great, great book. Uh, I only have it in German and yeah, hence I cannot give you a reading sample. That's another great book. He went from Rangers to Arsenal, failed there and then where did he go? To Barcelona. Not. Yeah, you have to be a Dutchman to do that. An American would have been sent straight back to DC United. For decades, the most fashionable nationality in the transfer market was Brazilian. As Alex Belos writes in Football, the Brazilian way of life, the phrase Brazilian soccer players like the phrases French chef or Tibetan monk. The nationality expresses an authority, an innate vocation for the job, whatever the natural ability. A Brazilian agent who had exported very humble Brazilian players to the Faroe Islands and Iceland told Belos, it's sad to say, but it's much easier uh, selling, for example, a crap Brazilian than a brilliant Mexican. The Brazilian gets across the image of happiness, party, carnival. Irrespective of talent, it is very seductive to have a Brazilian in your team. The sentiment was dented by the 1-7 loss in the semi-final at Belo Horizonte in 2014. In recent years, Belgians have been coming into fashion. After the 2014 World Cup, Costa Rican suddenly became the hot new items in every self-respecting club's wardrobe. After the little country got within a palace rule of a region the semi-final, the total value of transfer fees for Costa Rican players moving international rose from $922,000 in 2013 to almost $10 million in 2014. Note that. Uh, so from barely a million, it's a tenfold reported FIFA TMS transfer market service, the department of FIFA that oversees international transfers. A vice club will buy unfashionable nationalities, Bolivians, say, or Belarusians at discounts. So that's one. Then there's also gentlemen prefer brown blondes. You know, if you have scouts, blonde players always stick out as to others. So that's uh, one tenet. And then they go through the entire si uh, system of how uh, Brian Clough um, and uh, Peter Taylor actually built uh, Nottingham Forest up at a budget. Really, really interesting. And then, of course, relocation, relocation, relocation is another really big, um, another big uh, thing that you should always consider. And of course, these are not that bad on managers as well. But probably the most impactful chapter in this book is the one on penalty kicks. Uh, I did an entire talk on that that I actually should probably make into a video on this channel. By the way, this is the nice uh, reading mark that my daughter made from me. Milan in a way so I use it in there and actually I would say um, you should watch with what I'm reading here you should watch them the 2008 Champions League final penalty shootout yeah He's talking about in 1995, the Basque economist Ignacio Palacios Huerta, who was then a graduate student at the University of Chicago, began recording the way penalties were taken. In the early years, this was quite an artisanal labor. His wife and mother would send him videotapes of Spanish soccer TV shows. His paper, Professionals Play Minimax, was published in 2003. I actually read, read the paper, it's quite interesting. One friend of Ignatius, if you have the math background, <laughs> one friend of Ignatius uh, who knew about his research was a professor of economics and mathematics at an Israeli university. It so happened that this man was also a friend of Avram Grant. When Grant's Chelsea reached the final in Moscow in 2008, the professor realized that Ignatius' research might help Grant. He put the two men in touch. Ignatius then sent Grant a report that made four points about Manchester United and penalties and really watch the penalty shootout after you read this. Van der Saar tended to dive to the kicker's natural side more often than most keepers did. This meant that when facing a right-footed kicker, Van der Saar would usually dive to his own right and when facing a left-footed kicker, to his own left. So just his right-footed penalty takers would have a better chance if they shot to their unnatural side, Van der Saar's left. 
Ignacio emphasized in his report that the vast majority of the penalties that Fantasar stops are those kicked to a mid-height, say between one and, a, and one and a half meters, and hence that penalties against him should be kicked just on the ground or high up. Cristiano Ronaldo was another special case. Ignacio wrote in the report, Ronaldo often stops in the run-up to the ball. If he stops, he's likely, 85%, to kick to the right-hand side of the goalkeeper. Ignacio added that Ronaldo seemed able to change his mind about where to put the ball at the very last instant. That meant it was crucial for the opposing keeper not to move early. When the keeper moved early, Ronaldo always scored. The teams that wins the toss before the shootout gets to choose whether to go first. But this is a no-brain age, always should go first. Although lately, doesn't didn't work at the World Tour Cup. Teams going first win on average six percent of the time, presumably because there's too much pressure on the team going second, which is always having to score to save the game. Many players, especially those who normally never take penalties, succumb to the stress. Ignacio explains: Yes, they are hyper professionals, but they are not professionals in shootouts. Shootouts happen very infrequently. Lots of players go uh, their entire career without ever taking a penalty in a shootout. So yeah, the sixty forty. So. Um, Let's go a little bit further. Ignacio didn't know whether his research would be used by Chelsea in Moscow, but watching the shooter on TV, he was certain it was being used. Indeed, once you know the content of Ignacio's note, it's fascinating to study the shooter on YouTube. The Chelsea player followed his advice almost to the letter, and Grant confirmed to him years later, except for poor Nelka. United's captain Rio Ferdinand won the toss and turned to the bench to ask what to do. Terry tried to influence him by offering to go first. Unsurprisingly, Ferdinand ignored him. United went first, meaning that they were not likely to win. Carlos Tevez scored from the first kick. Michael Ballack hit Chelsea's first penalty high into the net to Van der Sar's left. Julian Boletti scored low to Van der Sar's left. Ignacio had recommended that Chelsea's right for the kicker choose that side, but at this early stage, he still couldn't be sure that Chelsea was being guided by his report. He told us later, interestingly, my wife had been quite skeptical about the whole thing, as I was preparing the report for Coach Grant, not even interested in looking at it. But then the game went into extra time, and then into the penalty shootout. Well, still skeptically. At this point, Cristiano Ronaldo stepped up to take his kick for United. Watching on TV, Ignacio told his wife the precise advice he had given Grant a Chelsea in his report. Chelsea's keeper shouldn't move early, and if Cristiano paused in his run-up, he would most probably hit the ball to the keeper's right. Cristiano did indeed pause in his run-up. To Ignacio's delight, Chelsea's keeper, Petr Cech, stayed motionless, not even blinking, in the Spanish soccer phrase. Then when Cristiano duly shot to uh, Cech's right, as predicted, the keeper saved. Ignacio recalled later, after that, I started to believe they were following the advice quite closely. As for his wife, I think she was a bit shocked. Um, what's astonishing, though, it seems to have passed unnoticed at the time, is what happened after that. Chelsea's next four penalty takers, Lampard, Cole, Terry, Kalou, all hit the ball to Van der Sar's left, just as Balak and Belletti had done. In other words, the first... So in the next paragraph, um, they described that all of Chelsea's kick uh, penalty takers then had shot to Van der Sar's left, and only Ashley Cole um, made the advice, uh, uh, disregarded the advice. So even John Terry, who slipped, he would have won it, because he could have put it there, but it didn't. So yeah. Uh, Van der Sar saw that all Chelsea keepers are shooting left. And now, it was Anelka's turn to kick. On the United's bench, Alex Ferguson was growing frustrated with his keeper. As Anelka jogged to the penalty spot, Ferguson later recalled, I was thinking, dive to your left. Edwin kept uh, driving to the right. But after six kicks, Van der Sar or someone else at Manchester United had figured out that Chelsea was pursuing a strategy. The Dutchman had noticed that the team was putting all its kicks to his left. As Anelka prepared to take Chelsea's seventh penalty, the ganking keeper standing on the goal line extended his arms to either side of him. Then, in what must have been a chilling moment for Anelka, the Dutchman pointed with his left hand to the left corner. That's where we're all putting it, isn't it? He seemed to be saying. This is where the books fall short of the medium. We urge you to watch the shootout on YouTube. Now, Anelka had a terrible dilemma. This was game theory in its rawest form. United had come pretty close to divining Chelsea's strategy. Ignacio had in, indeed advised right-footed kickers like Anelka to put the ball on Van der Sar's left side. So Anelka knew that Van der Sar knew that Anelka knew that Van der Sar tended to dive right against right-footers. What was Anelka to do? He decided to avoid the left corner where he had presumably planned to put the ball. Instead, he kicked to the Van der Sar's right. That might have been fine, except he hit the ball at mid-height, exactly the level that Ignacio had warned against. Watching a kick on TV, Ignacio was very upset. 
Perhaps Anelka was at sea because Van der Sar had pressured him to change his plans at the last moment. Van der Sar saved the shot. Ferguson said afterward, that was an accident. He pen his penalty safe. We knew exactly where certain players were putting the ball. Anelka's decision to ignore Ignatius' advice probably cost Chelsea the Champions League. That chapter is gold. The whole book is gold. Read this book. It will change your perception of soccer. And with that, let me know if you've read this book, what you think about it. Give me a thumbs up. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel. We want to see more book reviews. Although I'm running a little bit of Rustina books, but still there are a few in there. And yeah, I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel as it will keep you updated on all the things that are rotating in my soccer universe. And with that, I'm going to wish you a wonderful day. Bye.